Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Blystone. I'm the De Deputy Director of the Office of Victim Services at PCCD. And I too would like to welcome uh, you to the 16th Pathways Conference. I hope your first session was well received. As a reminder, if anyone has emotional re has an emotional reaction to this uh, keynote or any other of our presentations, please remember that we have a self-care room of KKIT volunteers. Please enter that room and they will move to a private breakout room with you. Our keynote speaker, Andrew Campbell, has provided some resources that you can find in the event resource tab located in the lobby. Andrew Campbell is an expert on family violence and associated risk of harm for adults, children, and animals residing in homes where this violence occurs. Andrew recently obtained his master's in public health from Purdue University and has presented at over 90 professional conferences and training since 2019. His 11 publications over the last two years include papers cited by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Centers for Disease Control, and over 600 international academic studies. His book, Not Without My Pet, covering the pet piece of family violence, was released in September of 2021. In addition to being an author, researcher, and educator, Andrew also speaks as a survivor of family violence in childhood. Andrew has advised us this morning that his work in, the, in this area uh, has been published online Sunday and published in today's USA Today. Without further ado, I introduce you to Andrew Kim. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks all of you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, um, as, as Jeff alluded to there, the, the, you know, the, I know everything that we do in this field and, and the work that, that, um, um, that, that, that we handle on a daily basis is difficult. Um, but I do want to add again, there's something about this pet piece that, that seems to add an, an, an extra layer. So I, I, I absolutely, before we get going today, want to make sure that you take care of yourself and, and your, um, you know, if, if, you, if you need to step away, mute the computer, whatever you need to do to, to take a minute, please do so. Um, this talk is hard for me to give, uh, to be honest. I, I speak often on these topics, um, but but this one is hard. Um, so much of myself is in this talk. So um, as we go through, I'll, I'll share my research and my work, but, but I'll also share um, a, a great deal about my own um, harm in youth and childhood and, and the dog who saved my life. Um, so today we're going to be looking at um, uh, domestic violence um, and, and really family violence. Um, which is, you know, the differing forms of abuse that can occur within the walls of our home. Um, I, when I think family violence, I think of pet abuse, child abuse, partner abuse, and elder abuse. Um, I, as I said, I speak often on these topics. I just recently gave a presentation on, on the subject matter that lasted about seven hours. So we have plenty of content for today. I'm going to throw a lot at you. I, 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 I treat each and every talk I give as if it were to be my last. So I'm going to give a lot of information um, today in a short period of time. Um, and then I will also try to stop um, short of of our ending time today to allow time for questions. Um, I'm also gonna share my contact info at the end and, and feel free to reach out with a question that way. I know sometimes the, the, the nature of some of the questions that may be brought up by, by today's content um, can, can be personal. And so I, I absolutely understand that and appreciate that and feel free to um, save some of those questions to email me later if you prefer. I speak often on these issues um, as, a, as a victim myself in childhood. Um, I do experience trauma every time I speak. It's, it's I mean, today's talk will wipe me out. Um, I, I've learned that. Um, I, I do have self-care things in place as well, but but um, it, especially today's content really is triggering for me and brings back a lot of hard memories. Um, but because of that, I, I, I thought public speaking wasn't going to happen. So I, I wanted to to create change in this field, um, but I was always just going to write. Um, public speaking was, was really hard. Um, I, I have a hyper responsive or, or kind of a broken stress response because of my own emotional trauma and youth. So meaning that anytime I experience um, what might be a, just a normal level of stress or even just slightly elevated for some, my system goes through the roof. Um, at, if, if you had been there for the first time I had spoke, you'd understand uh, my, my feeling that I'd never speak again. Um, it, I, I, I struggled to breathe. I, I um, had all kinds of, of clearly visible reactions to, to just trying to speak. Um, I've learned, though, as I've continued on, um, that if, as long as I talk about these issues and, and, and this work, that I'm okay and I can get through the talk. Um, I've, I've also kind of decided myself that, that while I'm afraid and it's difficult to public speak, um, my fear of, of um, if we remain silent, or, um, you know, is, is greater. Um, but I set a goal for myself to, to, to speak 100 times in 2019, thinking that it might take about 10 years to do so because of how hard it was. Um, but uh, today's actually presentation number 101. 
Um, I've, I've spoken in um, about 30 states and three different countries over that time period. Um, and so again, I, I speak often on these issues. I, I write often, I've, I've had several, several studies published here recently. Um, on Sunday, this is my newest article, was just um, published by USA Today. Um, and I was told I haven't had a chance to get a paper yet this morning, but um, the print version of USA Today um, was expected to have a photo of me and, and uh, this story you see here online. Um, if not today, then, then surely tomorrow. Um, so I, I, I do a lot of work professionally in, in this area, um, but more than any of that, um, I'm a victim myself. Um, at 14, I remember waking up to my mom um, screaming, crying on the floor. Um, I, I, I picked her up off the floor and said, you know, if you will not let my dad back in this home, I'll take care of you. Um, I had a, a younger sister, um, two in the house, and I said, you know, if, if it, just do not let him back in this house, even at, at 14, obviously well before I was into the research and, 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 and studies and, and things that I've, I've progressed to at this point, um, even at that age, I knew um, that, that great harm was being inflicted emotionally on my mom and sister. Um, and so I, I, I knew that enough was enough. And I said, you know, do not let him back. I'll, I'll get a job at 14, whatever I have to do. Trust me, do not let him back in this house and I'll take care of you guys. Um, I, I, she trusted me and I kept my word. Um, so from 14 to 26, I worked two or three jobs most of that time, did everything I could to take care of them. I didn't really date much in, in school. Um, friendships definitely suffered. I put everything I had into taking care of them and keeping them safe. Um, I, I spent most nights throughout that period not sleeping. Um, I was very much afraid that, that my dad was going to harm my mom. And so I, I, I did not sleep much during that period. And I actually still struggle to sleep to this day um, because of that constant fear in the night. Um, I thought if I fell asleep, that would be the time my dad would come home and something bad would happen to my mom. Um, so what I would often do is sit outside. It'd be three in the morning. Um, I'd be sitting outside with the dog you see pictured there, Shelby. Um, some nights he would, you know, lick the tears from my eyes as I cried. Other nights he would stand on the edge of the yard as if he was standing guard and saying, take a minute. Um, I, I, I recently wrote, wrote a book on, on the topic, but I, I don't think I can ever put into words what that dog did for me. Um, as I would get older, I would contemplate suicide just from the, the, the sheer weight of all the stress. Um, um, I would contemplate suicide many times. Um, and, and it was always his still calming, quiet voice that called from the darkness. You know, um, Shelby never spoke a word, but he always said everything I needed to hear. Um, and so a big part of, of my passion for, for including pets in these plans is because of how I opening, um, you know, his relationship with, with me was and, and, and how he saved me. The reality and, and just further unfairness when we think about emotional stress. And again, in my house, it was, quote unquote, just emotional harm. You know, 20 years later, um, I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling um, to, in dealing with that emotional harm. Um, and obviously not to downplay physical and sexual violence. Um, uh, but we do know that that while um, bruises will fade and fractures will heal, um, you know, emotional harm often lasts a lifetime. Um, and, and we often don't put enough, um, um, I think, um, emphasis on the emotional side of things. Um, the reality is, particularly in youth, um, when we think about emotional, psychological harm and, and extreme exposure to toxic stress, um, it can shorten our adult life as well. I have observable brain changes on MRI. Part of the reason and the urgency with my work is, is I don't know how long I'm going to be able to speak like this. Uh, notes make me nervous, so I, I don't use any notes. All of this that, I, that I'm giving you today it will be from memory. Um, but I am noting some cognitive changes. Um, as I said, through MRI, I, I, I know that I have observable brain changes from the extreme stress and, and emotional harm in youth. And it's just so unfair because, you know, we, we, we sometimes acknowledge that childhoods are stolen when we think about these types of things. Um, but we forget that, that not only does it steal our childhood, but it's also going to steal precious time with my own children as well. Um, you know, here I've broken the cycle. I've given my kids a, a safe and, and healthy environment to, to live and grow. Um, and, and it just takes my breath away. I'm sorry, every time to, to think about that, that, that time with them, which is more precious um, to me than anything in this world, also potentially being shortened because of, of what occurred in youth. Um, but it strikes my, it, it, it drives my passion. And, and I, I do think that, that while it's hard to talk today about these things, um, I do see it as an important part of my healing. So, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. When we think about family violence, um, domestic violence, the, the other types of, of areas within family violence, I, I certainly acknowledge and understand the need for the, the term survivor. Um, but particularly when we're talking about the emotional side, as, as we will be today, um, I think it's important to, to think about the differentiation between survive, a survivor and one who is surviving. You know, sometimes when we think about the term survivor or, or when we do think about the term survivor, it kind of implies that the tragedy or the accident is behind you. We think of, you know, surviving a shipwreck um, where, where you become a survivor of that. You see, like you, you kind of leave that behind. 
the reality for most victims of family violence is, is while they um, they do survive and, and are a survivor, they spend most of their life surviving. Um, as I said, you know, I, I, I consider myself a survivor. You know, I've, obviously I'm out outside of that house. Um, my dad's contact with me has finally stopped. It took writing the book, but he, he finally stopped and, and has left me alone. The letters and other things have finally stopped. Um, but here I am, as I said, 20 years, you know, uh, removed from that home and I'm still struggling. So again, I think it's so important to note um, when we think about the emotional side of things, um, I, important to acknowledge yourself as a survivor, but, but in reality, most victims will spend their entire life um, surviving. When we think about family violence, um, you know, I, I, one of the things that um, I, I often focus on and is really a focal point for today's presentation, I really view we have to, I, I really think we have to view the, the three you see here as a team. Um, and, and that being the adult victims in the home, child victims in the home, and any uh, companion animals or, or, or pet victims in the home. Um, it is my complete belief that if, if we, that, that we really cannot best help any you see pictured here, unless we are acknowledging the needs and, and, and helping all you see pictured here, we have to view them as a team. Um, now you see the adult victim picture there as a female. We also know that, that males are, are victimized, that um, these types of things occur in same sex relationships as well. But when we bring in the pet piece, at least in terms of, of, of what's reported in the literature, it's, it's almost, it's almost always, at least again, what's reported, a adult female victim and adult male perpetrator. Um, so I, you'll see it picture as a female, but again, we acknowledge that this can occur in, in all types of relationships and, and to both sexes, unfortunately. When we think about um, adding this child and pet piece, and again, something I don't think we often focus on, particularly when we're thinking about domestic violence, um, you know, we, 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 in, we include additional barriers. We know there are many barriers to protecting pets. There's a, an added need for resources when we think about um, in, involving children in our investigations and, and um, response to, to domestic violence. Um, but not only do they, you know, I, I obviously I feel the barriers are, are not insurmountable, but not only do they um, bring that side, they also bring an opportunity. And so again, when we view these three as a team, we, when we include all three pieces, there's added opportunity to improve detection, prevention, and intervention. Um, we know pets are often in homes where domestic violence occurs. So just in the general U.S. population, 68% of households have at least one pet. Um, this number goes up to 80%. So in 80% of homes where domestic, when, when we add in domestic violence, in 80% of homes, or in, in homes where domestic violence occurs, 80% of them have at least one pet. So pets are even more likely to be present in homes where, where partner abuse or domestic violence occurs. Um, children also often present, um, 59 to 60% um, of homes uh, where domestic violence occurs have at least one child residing there that from one of my recent studies. So again, we, we know pets and children are, are commonly in these homes. Um, we don't as often focus on them um, and, 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 and explore this particular area. Um, and, and piece of the puzzle. So for today's talk, we're really gonna focus in on those two. Again, I, I acknowledge and, and obviously speak to the needs of the adult as well. And if we're not meeting those, again, we can't help any unless we help all in this picture. Um, unfortunately for me, um, you know, and, and the reality is we often, sometimes we best know the things that we know and the things we've lived. Um, so I'm gonna focus in some of that area today just because I'll be able to add some extra insight from, from walking um, that path myself. As I said, overwhelmingly more often when we think about this um, pet piece in the context of partner violence, um, at least in what's reported, um, overwhelmingly more often a, a male perpetrator and a female victim. Um, and, and many of the, the graphics and, and, and info I'll share with you today are from my recent academic studies. Um, I've, I've shared a few of those with you in the resources. Um, any others that I, that I touch on today that you have interest, I'd, I'd be happy to send those to you as well if, if you reach out by email. We're gonna share some quotes now from um, survivors and, and, and those surviving um, in this area. Um, it wasn't until I told him I was leaving that he began to target my children and cats. Unfortunately, I hear this often. Um, we, we see perpetrators kind of um, using, um, targeting children and, and pets as a way to quote unquote, kind of change up things in the home. Um, th this may be most likely to occur when the perpetrator fears that the victim is about to leave the home and the relationship, report the abuse. Um, I, I hear that from perpetrators. I felt like I needed to kind of up the ante and, and kind of shift the way I was perpetrating harm. So I began to target, um, you know, the, the kids in the home, other pets in the home. Again, the, the idea is from a perpetrator standpoint, you want to inflict as much harm as possible. You want to squash any hope. And so often they will attack those most vulnerable in the home 
as a way of, of keeping the adult in the home quiet and, and keeping them from reporting. He said, if I left, it would be a death sentence for my beagle. My kids love that dog so much, and I knew he would kill it if I left. So I stayed for five more years. Just heartbreaking to consider. Um, in this particular example, the community had no plans in place for pets um, in their um, family violence or domestic violence intervention um, programs. Um, the, the, the local domestic violence shelter did not allow pets on site, did not have a pet fostering program. Um, so essentially, we see this victim um, being really stuck with the, the same heartbreaking decision that many are faced with um, across the country and around the world. And that is um, having to choose between the life of their pet um, and safety, um, right? Making just an impossible choice for many. Uh, many won't make it. Many, if you if you cannot protect their pets, they're going to stay in that home. Um, if, if they have to leave the home, they're going to become homeless. They're going to live in their car. They're not going to leave that pet behind. Um, many know it, it's essentially a death sentence for the pet. Again, we, you know, it, it makes sense if, if, if the house is unsafe for people to the extent that they have to leave it, um, it's surely not safe for a companion animal who is attached to those people to be left behind. The, ca the cats are completely different now that we have them. I remember how skittish they were in her home. It's as if they were absorbing the fear and stress my daughter was experiencing. These are just heartbreaking words of a father who lost two daughters um, in a domestic violence homicide. Um, so the um, um, first daughter um, who was in an intimate relationship um, with the, the offender um, had, had returned home. Um, she had just tried to end the relationship and then thought she had ended it. Um, the perpetrator had come back to her home and was waiting for her um, and, and he surprised her and, and killed her. Um, and, and while he was still there, the sister came to check on her sister. He, he was still in the home and killed her as well. So just heartbreaking story of, of a father who lost two um, to, to, to these types of, or, or to a domestic violence homicide or two homicides. Um, but I, I, I'll never forget when he was describing the cats in the home. He said, you know, I, I used to go into the house and, and I'd visit my daughter and, and you know, he, he said, you know, we thought something was a little different with the boyfriend, but we didn't realize it, it was anything like this. Um, but those cats acted so weird. You know, he said they, they would, they would, um, just act odd for cats. They, 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 we used to kind of joke about them and kind of laugh about them. Their behavior was just so different um, that, you know, they wouldn't want to around, be around other people. They just acted so skittish and, and off. Um, and now that, you know, my, his, his wife and, and he had adopted the cats, he said, you know, that they, they act ex exactly how you would expect cats to act. They, they act normal now. They, they do want to be around us at times and they want that human interaction. And, and he said, you know, I'm realizing these cats were trying to tell me something. You know, when no one else was around and it was just my daughter and her and her boyfriend, the, the fear that she was experiencing, they were there for. They were holding on to it. They were absorbing it. When we were in that home, even though the boyfriend may not have been acting abusive, they were showing us and telling us that things were not safe there. Something that's always stuck with me, and we do see that, um, that, that these pets can absorb fear experienced by their humans, um, you know, even when, when others aren't around. As I said, we, 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 I can't emphasize enough the, the viewing these three as a team. The adult is absolutely and certainly important as well. For the time that we have today, I'm going to focus a little bit on this child pet piece. Um, and again, um, um, as I said, it's, it's what I know best. It's, it's unfortunate that the road that, that I walked and lived. When we think about risk for children in, in homes where partner abuse or domestic violence occurs, they're high and they're across the board. Um, I'm going to focus on emotional risk and emotional harm today, um, but I always want to note physical injury and physical risk because it's there too. I'm thinking of a real life story of a child whose, whose mother was a nurse who had just ended an abusive relationship the night before. Um, the, the mom actually worked um, evenings at the hospital. Um, the, the child, I believe was about 14, uh, was, was home alone. Um, the abuser knew this, knew the mom was at work, showed up at the house, and according to the report, um, you know, told the child, this is the only way your mom will listen. Um, he proceeded to physically assault and, and harm the child for 45 minutes, um, ending with a, um, a severe strangulation episode while the child was restrained to a chair. Um, now the child survived those injuries, but, but um, they, were, they were catastrophic and, and obviously um, with significant lingering injury from them. Um, but again, I think it's important to note, I, I'm, I'm talking largely on emotional harm and emotional risk today, but we know the physical risk is still there. We also know if, if we're using just clear visible injury as an indicator of physical risk, we're missing a lot of kids that are impacted. Um, as I said, we're, we're concerned by physical injury, but again, bruises fade, um, fractures um, will heal, but these emotional injuries that often underlie these types of, of, of um, forms of abuse remain. Um, you know, it's, it's 
impossible for me really to imagine a child being in a home where domestic violence or partner abuse occurs, where a child is not impacted by it significantly. Um, it, it's just hard for me to, to even imagine that that type of scenario exists. Children are aware of what's going on and they are harmed by it, if not physically or sexually, surely emotionally. Um, but if we're just looking for a visible injury, and I, and I do hear that in my work around the country, that sometimes agencies will, when responding to domestic violence, if there's children in the home, you know, I'm looking for that bruise, I'm looking for um, a, a, a black eye, clear abrasions. If I see that clear visible injury, then I'll report it, then I'll work with child welfare to, to see what we can do. Um, interestingly, um, studies that, that look at how often that occurs, so an officer responding to domestic violence and finding a child with clear visible injury, find that, that it occurs only in 4% of the time. So only 4% of the time where a child's in the home where domestic violence occurs, will the child have a clear visible injury. So again, if we're using that as our benchmark of whether a child is impacted, we're missing 96% of children that are significantly impacted. Again, child lives in a home where this occurs, they are impacted, they are harmed. Um, it, it, domestic violence and these types of issues impact negatively everyone who resides within the home. Sexual abuse, so risk for a child experiencing sexual abuse in a home where, where domestic violence or partner abuse occurs. Um, kind of depends on where you are in the country, at least in what's reported. Um, but we see a range of 33 to 70% um, in academic literature. Um, so again, even a high risk for that as well. As I said, for the sake of today's talk and today's time, um, I'm going to focus on um, the emotional harm side of things. We know that children are often aware of much more than, than their caregivers even know. So even if we ask a caregiver how, you know, when we know these types of things are occurring in the home, you know, how much of this did the child see? How much did they witness? Um, we know that children can often relate verbatim events that their caregiver thinks they had no um, um, exposure to. And the same is true for me. I, I remember um, laying in bed um, and being able to hear everything through my parents' bedroom wall. Um, and. and the emotional harm. And again, I'll, I'll say I, I wouldn't wish seeing that or I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, seeing someone I love so much reduced to that state. Um, uh, the emotional harm, we again, sometimes downplay it, but we shouldn't. Um, uh, I, I, again, reminded of the words of a perpetrator. This was a child fatality investigation. And in his words, he, he began law enforcement doing a good job of just letting him continue to talk. Um, again, they were investigating the death of a child in the home. Um, but he said, you know, my relationship with the child's uh, mother, um, you know, I, I used to be, um, I, I used to hit her or punch her, but she's like a rock. She would fall to the ground um, um, and, and kind of cover and, and she would she would be fine. Um, but as soon as I tell her that she's unloved, that I've had better or attack her emotionally, she falls to pieces and I can do whatever I want with her. Um, and unfortunately, we, we, we again know that that perpetrators know that and they do it often. Um, but I could hear those types of things going on, but, you know, um, through the wall. Um, but I, I would know that as soon as I heard my parents' bedroom door open, I jump in bed, turn the light off, pretend like I'm asleep. Um, to their knowledge, I had no exposure to that. Um, I, I had no no knowledge of what was really going on. Um, but again, I, I heard every word. I mean, we know that's the case. We, we hear that said often. How do you think children would be impacted by threats or harm to pets in the home? And again, if we were in person, I, I would be making this more conversational. Um, um, but for now, just kind of think to yourself in, in your mind. Um, obviously, they're significantly impacted by it, right? Um, these pets are often extremely important to children. I shared how, how my dog saved my life time and time again. Again, if not for my dog, I don't know where I'd be today. I certainly wouldn't be here. Um, I honestly probably would have killed myself. Um, so I, I probably wouldn't be anywhere actually right now. And that dog was so that important to me. Um, but, but we see these kids often in these homes. Um, having a, a very special bond and a very important bond. So obviously, when that bond and, and these animals are threatened or harmed, they are significantly impacted by it. Um, to, uh, to better understand how children and, and adult victims in these homes are, are often impacted by harm or threats to pets, um, we kind of have to first think about what pets provide. So think about pets you have now that you've had in the past and, and some of the things that they provided for you. Um, and again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are just a few examples. Uh, pets provide so much. Um, and, and, and all of these things are critical for emotional health and well-being. The reality for many kids in particular in these homes um, where, where these types of things occur, um, a, a, a pet may really be their best and only chance at the things you see listed there. Um, and now when we think about it in this context, again, it, you know, we, 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 um, we don't necessarily see the victimized adult as not wanting to provide these things for their children. They may just have had so much taken, they have nothing left to give. 
Um, again, I speak from experience and 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 remembering those those early days after the incident I described at the start and and, and just how um, how dark those days were. Uh, my mom had so much taken from her. She's an excellent mom and, and she's a wonderful mom, but she had had so much taken from her um, that she just had nothing left to give there um, for a while. And and that's again, when my dog and my relationship became even stronger. And we see that occurring in the home. Again, not ideal. We would prefer children to be strongly attached to their caregivers. Um, but when we think of attachment, we think of it generally in that sense, um, more and more studies are beginning to explore pet attachment. And the idea that sometimes children, particularly in these homes, can form very strong and secure, stable attachments to animals who reside in the home. Again, speaks to the importance of including them in family violence intervention and planning. You know, in a single word, um, pets are family. 95% of Americans consider um, their pets to be part of their family. You know, I don't, I don't know what was wrong with the other 5% if they were having a bad day. Um, I would have asked the question again, um, but 95% of Americans consider pets as part of the family. But again, we still rarely see them included um, in family violence intervention, prevention, detection, um, planning, and initiatives. When we think about pets in America, I already alluded to this earlier, that, that um, we see pets being more likely to be in a home where domestic violence occurs. Um, in terms of the, the, the type of pet in homes where DV occurs, we see it, um, at least what's reported, mo most commonly we see dogs. Um, but we also see um, cats um, representing a, a large chunk there. But it's also important to note that, that um, it, it's not just these two that would be at risk, right? Um, we think of pets in all forms being potentially at risk. I'm thinking of an example in particular um, of a, it's actually a domestic violence or, or actually a um, kind of a, a, um, a support group for PTSD um, or, or those experiencing PTSD. Um, and, and they see individuals coming back um, from war zones in the military experiencing it. And they also see individuals um, in, in violent abusive homes experiencing it and, and help both, both sides. I think it's always important to note, um, um, you know, our brain and body doesn't differentiate um, where the harm occurs. Um, and so we do see a lot of some similarities, whether the, the, the PTSD from the, the, the risk and, and threat of, of death and harm occurs while you're serving overseas in the military, or it occurs in your living room uh, because you're afraid you're going to be killed um, either by an intimate partner or, or an abusive caregiver. Again, the brain does not differentiate. And we see some similarities there in, in, in individuals when they experience it in either of those two ways. Um, but this particular program um, utilized birds to help provide comfort for victims. Um, and, and some of the um, uh, victims who, who partook in the program, and I believe it's in South Florida, um, said, you know, that there was something about the bird being able to talk back to me and, and be able to have, um, you know, um, be able to teach them things and hear them say it back. That helped me. Um, when we think about rural environments, we, we may see individuals attaching to, to other types of animals that we don't necessarily consider traditional um, or, tradi or that we tr don't traditionally consider as pets. Um, but again, so I, I, I think it's important to note when we think about why pets and, and animals are, are at risk and harmed in these homes, it's probably likely um, to what they provide for victims. So in that sense, while dogs and cats are the most commonly reported, we see really any type of animal or non-human animal in these homes would be at great risk, right? Um, as I said, perpetrators want to kind of squash hope. They want to squash support. So if victims have a relationship with an animal that is an escape from abuse or that is positive and that it's pouring positive energy and, and health into them, that animal is going to become a target. So I think it's important to note um, cats and dogs most commonly reported, but really any animal residing in these homes would be potentially at risk, again, if they become a target of the perpetrator, and especially if the victim is considering leaving the home and perpetrators may, as I said, feel the need to kind of quote unquote, change things up and to begin to target these animals. Kind of tying everything together, we, we've, we've spoken about so far, as I said, children are likely to be significantly impacted by any type of violence or abuse occurring in the home. Um, again, they're, they're affected by violence outside the home, but there's something just so damaging about the abuse and violence when it occurs within the walls of your own home, right? The very place, and the, if, if anywhere, where you should feel safe, that you should be able to, uh, you know, uh, um, escape the, the storms waging outside in the world. When you're abused and harmed there, it is extremely impactful and, and, and harmful. Um, in many cases, these pets may be, particularly for children, it's a, for adults as well, but particularly for children, it may be their sole source of s emotional support. Unfortunately, sharing a photo here of a stuffed animal, this isn't a specific one, but it's the closest thing I could find that looks like um, the, the stuffed animal from the story that I'm, that I'm about to tell. Um, in this case, the, the child's German Shepherd was providing great comfort to them. The child resided in a home where domestic violence partner abuse occurred. 
Um, but the, the, the child's dog had been a source of comfort. The perpetrator killed the dog. Again, I think there's a connection there, right? If victims find support from animals, they become a target of the perpetrator or can be. Um, he had killed the, the dog. And so the child kind of reverted back to this um, stuffed animal that they had found emotional support from in their early days. So then the perpetrator began to cut the ears off, cut the arms off, cut the legs off. Again, perpetrators attacking things that bring comfort to victims in the home. Again, things that are working in the opposite way that the perpetrator is working. Even further heartbreak when we think about these issues. Um, I have 75% here. There's another set that says up to 76% of incidents of pet abuse um, occur directly in front of children. So the, the child will directly see it. Um, we often see in this context, uh, when we're talking about partner abuse and pet abuse occurring in that context, we can see perpetrators going out of their way to make sure the children witness it. Um, I can think of many stories and accounts of perpetrators actually restraining children to chairs, forcing them to watch these abusive acts. Again, if you're wanting, if this act is about power, control, wanting to squash hope, you're going to want to cause as much harm as you can in the act. Um, so again, we, we see children often being forced to um, witness these types of horrific um, incidents. Um, for many reasons, all of them heartbreaking, children who witness uh, animal abuse in this context are, are, are at risk of going on to perpetrate animal abuse themselves. And this is something we have to pay attention to. When, when children are committing acts of animal cruelty, we have to ask and, and think about why. You know, could this child themselves be suffering abuse right now or have they um, witnessed abuse or experienced abuse in the past? Um, because again, if children are engaging in these acts, there, there are few predictors stronger of them going on to commit future acts of violence and abuse. And this is particularly true for young children. Um, so it's something about when a younger child is committing these acts, it seems to just jumpstart the cycle and process. Um, so again, we have to pay attention when children are committing these acts. It's not the time to just explain away the behavior or say they'll grow out of it. When they're intentionally committing acts of animal cruelty and abuse, um, we have to pay attention. Sharing some specific examples from the study you see pictured here next of, of children's accounts of these types of events. My dad last week said that he was very upset with my mother and that he was going to burn the bird's wings with a lighter. The day that my dad said he would burn my dog on the grill, I took him into my room and I locked him in the closet with food and water until the next day. My dog always sleeps with me in my room so that my dad doesn't hurt him. Again, we just think of this severe and significant emotional anguish these children are likely experiencing. Um, and, and I have the last example there in yellow because it reminds me of a story um, here in, in Indiana. Um, a child was falling asleep in the classroom um, um, and uh, continually the teacher kind of probably appropriately just assumed an appropriate assumption, I mean, that based on the child's age that maybe they were just up late playing video games or watching TV or, or for whatever reason they were falling asleep. Um, but an astute school counselor dug into this a little deeper and said, you know, um, you know, this keeps happening. What's going on? Uh, the child said, well, you know, I, I, my, my bed is, is barely big enough for me, um, but I sleep with my German shepherd um, and um, there's just not enough room for us. Um, he's moving all the time. I wake up all night. And the counselor said, well, you know, then don't sleep with your dog. And the child said, well, you don't understand. My, my dad hurts my mom. And he said that um, one day I'm going to wake up and this dog is going to be gone. So the only way I know my dog will be there in the morning is if I hold him through the night. Again, heartbreaking emotional anguish. And, and we think of this child living with this fear, not only for his mother, but, but for the dog as well. Doesn't mean that every time a child is falling asleep in the classroom, it's something like this, but I think it's important to consider it on our continuum um, or, or, or potentially of what may be going on. The reality is for many kids, again, not obviously far from ideal, but, but just truth, for many kids, they may only be safe when they're at school. So again, when we when we think about kids feeling safe and, and maybe feeling like they're away from that particular environment, um, I, I think we do see and I often hear reports of, of them potentially falling asleep in the classroom. When we think a little further about how these types of things affect the children in the home, again, severe emotional anguish, um, witnessing harm to a caregiver, um, to a sibling, um, to a pet. Um, we, we don't often enough focus on the emotional side, but, but it's certainly important and long lasting. Um, we know that, that children in particular are impacted by uh, emotionally and psychologically, um, even before birth, um, at least in, you know, um, from, from studies that we're gonna look at, um, focus largely on, on early stages of infancy, but even as a developing fetus, uh, we see significant harm. Um, we think of what is termed the parental pathway when a, when a mother is, 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 is um, carrying the fetus and, and is the victim of abuse and harm, that again, it's kind of a pathway right to that, um, right to the, 
the developing fetus as well, and it experiences harm too. Um, so again, um, even before birth, I have a whole talk and, and I've actually coined the term uh, pregnant partner violence because I think domestic violence and harm that occurs uh, to a woman when pregnant is, is its own thing and, and needs to be separated from other forms and taken much more seriously. And I, and I, I provide a lot of emphasis on that um, for other presentations that are just specifically on that topic. Um, but we know that, that even before birth, children are impacted. When um, we think of the early years and, and early months and days in particular, obviously when children and, and when all of us, are, when we're born, um, our, our brains are not fully developed. We are, we are um, very dependent on an environment that's conducive for um, growth, a healthy, safe place to grow and learn. Um, unfortunately, many of the children um, do, in, in the homes we're describing today do not experience that. And, and hear what I'm going to say next carefully, because again, this is not a, a necessarily a death sentence for these kids, um, but the reality is is, is that um, it's, it's really just a, a, a one, one chance deal um, when we think about brain growth and some of those things in these early ages. Um, you know, you don't, you don't get a second chance to grow your brain. So when we see this harm and um, fear and toxic stress disrupting the physiological processes in these early days and, and ages, um, you know, that, that, that change and, and harm can be irreversible, from, at least physiologically. So again, um, harm in these early days, and, and, and I, I speak to it because sometimes as I'm traveling, I'll, I'll hear this idea that children somehow, one of the things I, I've heard often repeated is before a child could speak, I wasn't afraid necessarily when I was responding to domestic violence about them being harmed by it again. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're worried about children at any age, but especially in these early days um, and months and, and years, that harm and that exposure to, to um, emotional harm can cause catastrophic damage to the, our body's physiological system. Um, we know toxic stress, I often describe it as kind of the silent killer in these homes. We think of um, domestic violence homicides. Again, we think of a, of a violent fatal incident, um, but many victims will die slowly over years and years um, from harm emotionally um, that they've experienced. Um, when we think about um, stress and our stress response, we know that um, obviously when we experience stress, our, our heart rate increases, our blood pressure goes up. Uh, cortisol is one of the hormones our body releases to bring us back down to restore homeostasis. It's intended just to be a quick response, um, um, you know, something that, that obviously we're not living, hopefully living in stress, so it just happens quickly. But these victims are living in stress. And so we see cortisol just being constantly um, flooded and, and pumped through their systems. And this kind of um, creates what I refer to in, in my introduction as, as a kind of what I experience, a, a broken response to stress. Um, and we can see this going one of two ways, either being a hyper-responsive system or under-responsive system. When we think under-responsive, we're, we're thinking of, of you know, a, an adult or child victim with kind of that flat affect where, um, you know, on the outside, they look like everything's okay, but that's certainly not what's going on on the inside. Um, so again, I, th I think it's, it's important to note um, just, again, the impact of, of the stress exposure that many in these homes experience. Um, as I said, um, and, and again, you'll see me skip some slides today. I'd be happy to share the full slide deck. I've, I've shared my slides before, but even up to um, last night, I, I was making some changes and adding new information. As I said, I give every talk as if it were my last. And so um, um, you'll see me skip some slides because I have extra info today. I I'd be happy to, to share that. So if I skip anything and you want to know more about, email me and I'll send that to you. As I said here, here's another way to depict what I just described. Um, again, I, I hear it sometimes downplayed that these children, that, that before they can speak, um, um, you know, maybe they're, they're not as likely to be at risk or harmed, and, and the opposite is true, particularly in these early years and early months. Our bodies are developing at such a rapid rate. When that growth um, is, is interrupted by exposure to abuse and violence, again, we, we often see permanent effects on our bodies, um, which again is, is, is extremely concerning. Further thinking about how children are impacted by exposure to stress in these homes, um, studies show a dose response with IQ, particularly when children's or when the child's under the age of five. Um, we also see children that experience these high levels of, of stress exposure um, with, with observable brain changes, such as I have myself. Um, and, and the areas that, that are most often directly impacted are, are those responsible for memory, learning capacity, and then again, overall brain size can be impacted as well. Now, when I talk about these things, um, particularly when I'm working with child services, one of the things I often or most often hear is this idea that, um, you know, we, we know these things are happening, but, but it's impossible to prove. Um, it's very difficult to prove in the courtroom to get these things to stick. Um, yes, we, we hear and know that the emotional harm is, is, is causing injury. But, you know, when we have a bruise or a fracture, we, can, we have imaging, we can take a picture, we can show it. It's much harder to, to visualize these invisible injuries. I definitely hear that um, and understand what's being said there. 
the reality is, though, even though we sometimes term these as in, invisible injuries, um, they do not remain that way for long. Um, they, they always visualize in some way, whether it's through behavior or other types of health concerns or conditions. Um, but there are, in fact, ways to visualize some of these types of, of, of forms of harm. Um, you see here a CT on the left of a normal three-year-old child on the right. The child, um, no, no, the, at least in the case history, no evidence of physical or sexual abuse. It was just sensory deprivation. Again, what I was talking about, not having that environment conducive and, and um, for healthy growth. You see the, the brain size impacted, and then we also see um, unhealthy areas of the brain, again, associated with, with where memory, learning capacity, and things such as that are, are, occur. We can also see it by PET scan. So this type of scan, you're going to look for your reds um, as, as being blood flow and your, your lighter colors, red and yellow. You can see on the left, a normal brain on the right. Again, not necessarily physical or sexual abuse, just again, quote unquote, just emotional abuse. Um, so we can visualize them in this way. Now we know that radiation exposure and cost of these exams often um, make it difficult to include these in, in intervention planning. However, I do think there is another way to, to show some of these things that, that seems to be gaining more traction. So while I understand and acknowledge that, that sometimes these injuries are, are obviously there and hard to prove, I do think they, they won't always be that way. I think we, we are, science is progressing to one day where we will be able to um, more, more visually or, or be able to visually appreciate and, and show these um, types of things. Um, cortisol measurement, I, I think, ha has some interesting promise. So again, I, I mentioned cortisol as being one of the hormones our body releases to slow our stress response. We have a normal um, flow um, throughout the day um, that, that is expected. You see the black dots there and the green slope. Um, that's kind of our diurnal cortisol slope, our, our normal um, levels of cortisol. Kids and adults in these, in these homes are often in the red or yellow, um, again, because they're, they're either hyper or under responsive. Either way, if you stray from that green line, either high or low, um, it puts your body at, at risk of, of, of being at greater risk of suffering disease, of injury, um, and, and of other types of, of harming things as well. Um, but, but interestingly, studies that have looked at, at measuring this have, have been able to, to um, show some um, um, or, or, or at least to discover some interesting findings. And again, I think that there is some hope here in one day being able to better prove some of these emotional injuries. Um, you can just with a saliva swab, you can track cortisol levels throughout the day and, and indicate even in children um, potential concerns for um, an elevated or under responsive type of system. Tying everything I just shared together with a kind of a practical um, example, um, this was from one of my studies, again, in, in Marion County here in Indianapolis, Indiana, where um, I'm located. One of my studies, I looked at how officers observed victims to appear when, when they arrived on scene of a domestic violence incident. Um, not surprisingly, the victims were, were most commonly reported by officers on scene to appear afraid, complaining of pain, and crying. Um, heartbreaking, but but not necessarily surprising given uh, what we know about domestic violence and how officers might find them when they respond to the scene. What was interesting and, and concerning um, was, was how they um, observed children on scene. Um, and this is a large in value, um, over 1,300 cases that I looked at. Um, half the time, these children appeared calm. So again, your best chance at a, at a secure human attachment, your adult caregiver is upset, complaining of pain and crying. You know, it, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but why are we concerned by calm children? Um, I, I have had some instances where an agency has said, well, thank goodness the child's calm. All these things are going on and the child's fine. You know, calm does not equal fine. Um, we, we are actually very concerned that a child can appear calm um, given these conditions and scenarios. I think it plays right back into the cortisol and, and toxic stress, as I just described. Um, you know, when, when a child is, may appear calm on the outside doesn't mean they're calm on the inside. Interestingly, studies that, that interview children following police involvement related to domestic violence, more than half will describe that as being the scariest thing that they've ever experienced. Um, so again, this idea of children being calm, um, it's, not a, it's not, a, not a time to feel relieved that they're okay. Um, we're very worried. We're worried they may have been coached. We're worried they may have been threatened. This idea that you know, if you show a certain way or act a certain way, it's going to um, reap consequences for you or someone you love. Could be another human or it could be a pet. Um, so we're very concerned by this. I think it's important to note and remember, particularly when we're providing education in this area. Children may appear calm. Many reasons to be worried by the fact that they are calm um, at the very time when they probably shouldn't be calm, um, given the circumstances. Maybe even 
um, more likely to be the case for children, younger children. So again, we know children under the age of five are disproportionately represented on scene when, when officers respond to domestic violence, and these kids are even more likely to be described in this way. So important to note and keep that in the back of your mind. Calm children does not equal always safe children. Um, we need to be thinking about some of these things, even when the child on the outside appears like things are okay. Again, as I alluded to in the intro, um, we think about toxic stress and how it robs both ends. Sometimes we acknowledge that it steals childhoods, but we forget that it can shorten adult lives as well. It's just something that continues to take from victims and, and again, um, um, often will shorten our lives. I'm going to shift gears just slightly. Um, I'm going to speak for another probably 35 minutes or so and then allow some time for questions. Um, again, when I say shift gears, we're still talking about our same content, but talk about it in a little different way. Um, so this is a, another one of my studies. This actually um, was the first study in uh, literature to use police officer data to, to explore the link between domestic violence and, and pet abuse. Um, it's become the most shared study ever published in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence. Um, and um, in the top 1% of any study ever published in any journal in terms of shares and reach. Um, and it, again, it um, looks specifically at this issue and I'm gonna dig a little deeper into it. I believe this is one I shared with you today. Um, for this study, I, I looked again at, at domestic violence reports and here in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I split it up into two groups. So domestic violence or, or when officers are called for a domestic violence incident where the abuser also has a, a known history of pet abuse and where the abuser does not have a known history of pet abuse. And again, it's important to differentiate just because we don't know about the history doesn't mean it didn't happen. But at least from a study standpoint, you kind of need, um, you know, obviously a, a, a data point. And so that's what I looked at. Um, just in general, IPV, intimate partner violence, um, sus um, uh, where the, the suspect did not have the history of, of pet abuse, we see victims reporting rape or, or forced sex 8% of the time. We're already concerned by that. Uh, but when we know just one thing, that the suspect also harms pets, that rape number jumps to 26%. So again, just one characteristic. And I'll add, um, as I continue to, to look at these types of things, they're, they're, at least in my work, there seems to be no single characteristic other than the suspect history of, of pet abuse that, that increases so many or risk for so many characteristics at once. Uh, again, we know strangulation very well or, or very strongly tied to risk for homicide. Um, but when we think about this history of pet abuse, it is tied to so many different risk factors. Um, again, I, I think it's important to note and, and that's why I'm sharing it today. Strangulation, as I just uh, mentioned, we know the strong tie to, to risk for homicide. In general, in Indianapolis, already very high, 47%. Uh, most national estimates are around 10 to 30%. So that's a high number already. But when we add in just one piece that the suspect also harms pets, we're at 76%. Um, again, alarming conditions. Uh, we think of toxic stress. Again, I spoke to the harm that, that it creates. And we think of emotional abuse. Uh, in this particular scenario, these victims describe perpetrators often would not let them quote unquote, live their life, let them do anything without their permission. It's extremely emotionally harming to, to be um, living in those types of conditions. 55% in general jumps to 84%. Again, just knowing one thing that the suspect also harms pets. Uh, when we look at living with a daily fear, they will be killed. This is an important one. I, I mentioned PTSD earlier. When we think about severity of, of PTSD symptoms, um, the, the more severe cases are, are, are most often associated with prolonged periods of fearing for one's life. So again, the, the, the length of time that you fear for your life is often tied to the severity of PTSD. So again, living with daily fear, um, we're very worried about, about the emotional impact of that. 35% um, in general jumps to 78% just knowing one thing. As I said, I, at least in my work, there seems to be no single characteristic um, other than a, a, a perpetrator's abuse of pets that seems to rise risk across the board for, for every type of, of, of harm. I've spoken often about the child pet bond today. Um, and again, I, I talked about the importance of it um, for me in my home where domestic violence occurred. Um, unfortunately, we're gonna look at, um, we've talked about some of the positive impact. We're gonna look a little bit now um, at, at when things go wrong. Um, and again, as I said, children unfortunately can be at risk to um, abuse and, and harm animals themselves. We also know that that if children are strongly attached to pets in these homes, the, the grief when they lose that pet, whether it be through abuse or or just natural causes, that, 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 that grief is gonna be extreme. Um, I know when I lost my dog, um, it felt like a piece of my soul was wrenched from me. 
I don't know how else to describe it. It, I, I, it took 10 years after I lost Shelby before I could look at a picture of him. And that's not an exaggeration. That's, it's true. I, I couldn't even look at a picture of him. I haven't even, I mean, it, it's probably only been about four years ago that I uh, started to look at pictures of him again. And I only have 10. I've got 10 pictures that I can look at. I have many more, only 10 that I can look at um, because I've adjusted to them. The only talk I've ever given that I had to stop in the middle of, um, I was speaking in New Mexico in person, big, large screen behind me. Um, and I tried out a, a different photo of Shelby that I didn't normally look at. And it, it was so, you know, I, my, my relationship with my dog was 100% beneficial. There was no negativity to that relationship yet there's so much pain that's still attached when I see Shelby because of the pain I was experiencing in that. Um, so again, I, I think it's so important to note that um, we see these pets providing comfort for kids in these homes, but this is not um, a permanent solution. These kids will often outlive these animals and when they lose them, again, we have to be ready. Um, that's when I would have been at great risk for suicide. And I remember thinking that way. Um, again, you, I, I put so much of myself into that dog that when I lost him, what was I gonna do next? Um, you know, and so again, I, I think it's important to note that again, as I said, unfortunately, kids often in, in the homes in the context we're describing today will witness the abuse and go on to commit these acts themselves. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these reports. Um, of, of, I'll, I'll share just a couple examples. These are actual animal control reports that, that indicate children committing these acts. Two kids hitting a collie dog with a stick in a fenced yard. Parents don't seem to care. Caller states her daughter texted her saying her 13 year old son won't quit abusing and hitting the dog. 10 and 12 year old males or 10 to 12 year old male swinging a gray white dog on a leash above his head and slamming it on the ground. Two young girls dragging dogs by the leash, picking them up, throwing them um, and, and continuing those acts. Again, kids are doing this. We have to pay attention, right? We, we, we have to take this seriously. These are not incidents just to say, oh, um, you know, that's kids being kids. It's not, we're, we're worried by what's happening here. Um, this information is actually from my newest study that's currently in peer review. It's not even out yet, but hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Um, it's the first study, again, in the world to, to look at or to utilize animal control reports and explore how children are involved in them. Um, you see the breakdown here. Most commonly, if children are involved in an animal control report, um, it's because they're perpetrating the act. So, again, um, I, I, I do think that... that um, um, again, these, these, these child perpetration of animal cruelty incidents do occur. Um, and, and when they do happen, we have to pay attention. It sets a dangerous cycle in motion, as I already alluded to, and we have to pay attention. Child is committing an act of animal abuse. We have to look back. We have to think, um, what's the child's history look like? Um, have they been exposed to abuse? Or are they being abused now or, or have they been in the past? Again, if we don't effectively intervene, that child is at great risk to go on to commit future acts of abuse and violence in their own home, as well as in the community and classroom. This is an extreme end example, uh, but I'll share an example here. Uh, this is from a police confession. At this time, he states that he remembers his early family life as being one of extreme tension. He states the tension came from the relationship that existed between his mother and father. He was not physically or sexually abused and did not witness any physical abuse. He said they were constantly at each other's throats and arguing. This is just an excerpt from a, a 200 plus um, confession that, that I read in its entirety, and it, it goes on to describe this same type of scenario. Again, the individual um, only, you know, only or just exposed to emotional abuse between his parents, and then he himself experienced it as well. He also say that during this time, he was cutting up animals. He would fantasize what it would be like to cut up a human being. Um, and again, these are excerpts from um, the police confession of, of notorious U.S. serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. It doesn't always go this way, that a child's emotionally harmed, a child's wit child witnesses emotional partner abuse, a child harms pets, they become a serial killer. Um, but I do think it's important to note that many serial killers do have that history. Um, sometimes we kind of incorrectly assume, oh, if they're a serial killer, it must have been severe physical and sexual abuse they experienced in youth. We don't always see that. We, we sometimes see the, the same continuum of, or the same idea and, and pathway of emotional harm, harms pets, goes on to obviously create mass acts of harm um, to humans and pets. Um, we also see the same history often present um, in, in, in perpetrators of mass murder as well as in school shootings. Um, even the most conservative estimates, and I say they're conservative because in this particular study, they only looked at um, perpetrators of school shootings that had a history of pet abuse noted in the media. Um, and, and that doesn't happen often. Um, and so again, we're gonna be the low end estimation and they still estimated that 41% of school shooters have a history of intentional animal cruelty. 
Um, if you work with law enforcement and speak with them, most of them um, bump that number much higher in terms of the, actually working um, these cases and looking at these types of things. Um, so again, even the most conservative estimates are that nearly half of these kids have the history. Most assume it's much higher, again, just based on, on the way the data is collected. We have to pay attention. Again, doesn't mean that a child is committing these acts are going to go on to commit an act such as this, but many who commit these acts have that as a history. Another way to look at these issues, again, I, I think um, it, it's useful sometimes. I know we're, we're talking about uh, or I'm talking about the same message, but we're looking at it from as, as many different ways as we can. I think it just kind of furthers and strengthens um, support for the issue. And, and I hope, um, you know, again, especially when I'm speaking to a, a larger number of, of people that, that we can find the right way to say it that, that sticks with you and that's helpful in the work that you specifically do in whatever discipline or, or capacity that, that you work to help these victims in these homes. Um, but another unique project that I'm engaged in right now is with Prevent Child Abuse Indiana. Um, we're looking at seven different Indiana counties where child abuse reports have continued to rise and trying to find kind of a non-traditional way um, to look at these, these rises in reports and, and incidents and, and see if we can improve our response. And, and the, the, the way that I propose and what we're doing is um, to, again, to try to lower child abuse, we're focusing on domestic violence and animal cruelty. And the idea being if, if, if we can um, better engage and, and work in those two areas in these communities, can we bring down these numbers as well? When we look at animal related incidents, so again, uh, animal cruelty, abuse or neglect here in, in my um, home county in Marion County, Indiana, um, we see in just over a single year, many incidents occurring. Um, the areas of sparing you see there are, are um, kind of different jurisdictions. So you see some sparing in the um, um, areas around Speedway, around Lawrence and Beach Grove and around the International Airport. Um, again, areas where um, jurisdictions are different. And so there may be dots there too. Um, essentially everywhere that, that Marion County reaches, we, we see runs. And um, although we do see specific areas that, that have a higher <clears throat> number of runs, I think it's important to note that. <clears throat> Another important thing to consider is when we take these same incidents and we overlay them by a child density map. So this is uh, using census data to look at where children reside in our community and in our counties. And the darker shades indicate higher concentrations of children. So again, we, we see more of these incidents often occurring in areas where, where we do see a high number of children, which again, I think is important to note when we give the overlap and we think about the risks that, that these types of incidents um, often show for all. Again, Animal abuse, I think, is a very important indicator of risk in your, in your communities, um, just because of everything I've talked about today and many of the things that I won't have time to talk about today. Um, but again, if, if we know if, if animals are at risk, humans are too. And particularly when a, a perpetrator intentionally harms animals, they are a significant risk, not only within their home, but to responders and their community as well. So again, if we're seeing a rise and a high incidence in these types of things, we should be very worried. Um, one of the things I often say is, you know, when, when we want to um, kind of estimate how bad community violence will be in five years, you know, you want to look at, at how bad abuse and violence is within the walls of your homes in your community right now. Um, we, we see these types of, of, of harming behaviors and, and forms of abuse, you know, may start in the home, but they rarely stay there. And this animal abuse one is a big one, in my opinion, when we think about uh, risk in the future. Other ways to look at this is, is looking at two different data sources now. And a lot of my work, again, I'm doing with mapping now. So these are police reports for domestic violence over a single calendar year. Different data source, animal control runs over the same calendar year. You'll see that um, kind of largest concentration there, um, kind of in the um, northeastern um, portion of Indianapolis there in the center. Um, it's important to note that that's not where we see the most people, because that's usually one of the questions I get asked when we're in person is, is you know, well, you're just seeing more dots because there's more people there. The, the area of greatest density of DV and animal abuse is not the greatest density of people. Um, that particular zip code where you see that greatest cluster is actually 10th or 11th on, on population density list. So it's not just more people. We are observing at least a spatial relationship between these two types of things as well. Another Indiana community, Allen County. Again, seeing a similar pattern of domestic violence incidents occurring in the same area where we see animal control runs as well. And finally, the last community I'll share um, is Boone County, Indiana. I share this now, too, um, because I think there's added relevance and particularly there was um, during um, the pandemic lockdowns. Um, I, I became very concerned very early in the pandemic when I was noting in, in China that their, their um, actions of, of lockdowns um, was spiking risk and incidents of domestic violence. 
Um, I became very worried that in the U.S., if we did lockdowns as well, that we would also see that that major jump and create essentially horrific conditions where victims were trapped with perpetrators. Um, I wrote a paper on that that was published um, early on as kind of a predictive piece, and unfortunately, it, it came true. Um, it was been cited now by um, over 600 academic studies, and the CDC cited it when they um, eventually recommended reopening schools. Um, but one of the key things I noted in that paper was from this project, and it's this right here. So on the left, I was concerned in what did happen during lockdown when victims found themselves trapped with a perpetrator that they would not be able to report domestic violence because when we look at um, police data, most domestic violence reports that come to law enforcement come from the adult victim themselves. And how are you gonna feel safe to do that when you're trapped with the perpetrator? So my concern in what I predicted might happen, and unfortunately did, is that these calls on the left would, would go quiet, at least during lockdown. Now they picked up after lockdown, but during lockdown that they would go quiet. Um, but on the right, the calls would keep coming in. And it's important to note that given the relationship, the shared spatial locations, if you lose your calls on the left, you may still have these calls on the right coming in. It speaks again to the importance of including animal welfare in our efforts. Um, again, we want to protect pets. They deserve to be protected too, but when we protect them, we better protect people in our community as well. The reason for why the, the calls on the right still kept coming refers to the report source, which I'll get to in, in two slides. I do want to note, I have the dots up there pulled back like that to protect victim um, location. The last thing I want to do is create risk by, by showing, you know, zoomed in maps to, to show specific houses where these types of things are reported. Um, but these are more just dot than dots that just look like they might be in the same areas. Many of them are occurring in the same homes. There's a single household that was represented by dots there and, and the, the runs for DV and, and animal control. And then the same thing here too. Again, we're worried when animal <clears throat> uh, cruelty occurs. We're worried when DV occurs, when they both occur. Again, risk seems to be spiked across the board and, and we absolutely have to pay attention. Um, but as I said, when the, when the calls for DV dropped off, but the animal calls kept coming in, it gets back to report source and just is, is another angle of why it's important to include the pet piece. Um, when we think about children and, and reporting, well, actually, I'll get into that on the next slide. So I, I already mentioned the, the adults often are the ones who report domestic violence to law enforcement. It's the adult victim themselves who calls. Animal abuse, almost always, and we finally have a number of my new study, um, which which will be out any day. We'll be the first to quantify it. But 80% of the time, animal abuse is reported by a neighbor. Um, so while adult um, while adult victims report, um, sorry, let me get back here. So while adult victims report domestic violence themselves, animal abuse almost always reported on the right there by a neighbor, um, and, and that's important. Um, neighbors do not report domestic violence. Only about 8% of police reports um, for domestic violence come from a neighbor. Only around 12% of child abuse reports come from a neighbor, 89% animal cruelty from a neighbor. Um, so again, a, a, a rare opportunity to engage neighbors. Neighbors often likely know much information about humans in that home too, and that may be our best chance to get that information. Um, again, if you've got someone calling to report animal cruelty and they're reporting it on their neighbor, it's a great time to ask and say, hey, do you have any concern about humans in that home as well? And it's again, that's one of the things that I was saying, if those DV numbers go away, you're probably still going to get your animal calls because neighbors are lockdown proof because they were even more likely to be in their home during lockdown. So we, it's one of the, the only area of family violence where our report source wasn't really um, disrupted, but rather had more access. So again, important to note, um, again, as I said, when we bring in the pet piece, we create additional opportunity as well. Here's how it looked like visually during lockdown. So we see, we see uh, domestic violence reports to police um, in Bloomington and in Indiana in, in 2019, you see in blue and orange, we see um, the reports in 2020. Um, and again, the, the strangest or, or the most strict, strictest parts of, of lockdowns in, in our community were, were from March into May. Uh, you see that drop in reporting before it begins to gradually rise. You know, again, you can't report domestic violence if you can't report it. And for many victims, they did not feel safe to do so during lockdown. So we saw that kind of slope and, and then a gradual increase as, as some of these restrictions were lifted. Same with child maltreatment of reporting in Indiana. Again, you see that that dip. It would be nice, that orange dip there, if it indicated that child abuse went away for those months and, and it, it, it or at least dramatically reduced. That would be great news. Um, but again, when risk was at an all-time high, um, you know, it, it does not pass the common sense test that abuse just stopped when children were suddenly trapped with a perpetrator during lockdown. 
I mentioned adult victims report domestic violence. Child abuse obviously is, is most often reported by outside agencies such as schools, um, hospitals, um, legal courts, social services. Again, many of those agencies with limited access to kids during the lockdown period. Um, but as I said, animal abuse, we do not see and did not see that dip, at least in, in most forms of, of, of reporting. Now, there were certain types of animal cruelty that went down, um, such as leaving pets in hot cars and things such as that, which again, not surprising given that all the travel restrictions that, that individuals were less likely to be out. And we also saw fewer cases of, of, of people moving out of a house and leaving an animal behind. Again, not many people doing that during the pandemic. When we look at specific intentional inflicted acts of cruelty though, um, we, we, we saw them remain the same or even potentially increase at the very times uh, reporting of child abuse and, and domestic violence went down. Just another reason to include uh, animal welfare in your efforts. Um, and, and again, a, a tangible one, particularly given the, the current conditions of, of most societies and communities. Another important note, I'm going to share just a couple more pieces of information and then I'm going to share um, or, or at least in this vein of thought, and then I'm going to share some effective responses to these issues. The last thing I want to do is, is I know it's a, a negative picture, but um, a, um, I think a realistic and, and real one. Um, but the last thing I want to do is, is say all these things that are hard to hear and, and just say good luck with that. I also want to share some um, insight in, in terms of some programs that have, have worked to better address these issues and, and, and make a difference. When we think about domestic violence, though, and, and we think about this idea of, of when is a victim at greatest risk, we know studies indicate a, a greatest risk for homicide, um, you know, when the victim is in the action of leaving the home. Um, and, and this was from a survey ask and, and got that same answer that we see in literature. It's interesting to think, though, about a risk for children and pets. And I kind of already alluded to this earlier. Uh, most feel it's it's the same when the when the family is leaving. But again, if you remember one of the early quotes I shared, my belief is that that the risk for children and pets would be great when the victim is leaving too. But more about when they begin to think about leaving. Again, I hear perpetrators say, um, you know, when I when I started to sense that there might be that thought of leaving, I, I began to really um, feel the need to kind of switch things up a bit. The way that, that I think is is best visualized is from a family violence timeline that I've created. Um, this was from analysis of um, at the time I made it about 10,000 police reports of domestic violence, but now I've analyzed hundreds of thousands. Um, but I've, to come up with this timeline of, uh, again, a sample of, of, of what we may see in these homes, um, each, each box representing an incident. On average, my studies indicate that on average, victims will experience 10 incidents before they call 911. Only one in four ever call 911, but if they do, they've already experienced 10. So again, I think that's why agencies feel like sometimes we're behind the eight ball from the get-go with these families. It's because there's already this cycle of violence and abuse well on its way before we ever even get that first call. On average though, we're concerned by that, that, that it, 10 times um, victims have experienced these incidents, children have witnessed these incidents before we ever get that first call. When perpetrators have a history of harming pets, um, it's my belief again, that it's very effective in delaying this initial call and it creates this period of critical delay. So while victims will experience 10 incidents and call 911 in general. If perpetrators have a history of harming pets, I find that victims will experience 20 to 50 before calling. So not only is it a, a tactic we often see perpetrators incorporating that is targeting pets and, and likely children too, um, as an attempt to delay, it's also an extremely effective one. Um, it can delay the call by as much as eight to 12 months. And again, 10 to 40 extra incidents. And each incident increases in severity and risk. So again, you think about being concerned about getting your first chance to engage with these families after 10, um, how much more so if you don't even get that first call to there have already been 50 incidents. Uh, so again, I think it, it speaks to the importance. When we think about the yellow zone you see there um, and the, where I think risk is extremely elevated for pets and children, um, while you may not be getting your DV call, you may not be getting um, a child abuse indication, you may very well be getting reports to animal control about concerns for animals in that home. So again, it, it speaks to the importance. Um, when, when we look at this um, visually, um, in terms of this critical delay, I already kind of alluded to this. Um, animal control runs on the left um, there in, in 2017, the highest concentration highlights or lights up there, and the year later, DV runs in the same area. So again, um, even when we drill it down to just look at, at hot spots and things such as that, I think it's so important. There are so many reasons why this pet piece is important, not just protecting pets, but protecting humans and, and our communities and uh, within the homes that make up those communities as well. As I said, I'm going to share some ideas here for effective prevention and intervention. I shared a study um, with you that I'm not going to go into for sake of time because I do want to allow some time um, for questions. 
Um, so I, I may, I guess I, I may hint at this or, or just touch on this just briefly. Um, but when we think about this pet abuse piece, not only does it increase risk for, for families within these homes, but for the responders to these incidents as well. Um, we, this is a study I was indicating that I um, released earlier this year, and I believe I shared with you in your, in your handouts. Uh, this is the first study to tie pet abuse to an increased risk for officers responding to domestic violence. Um, we know um, that there's no other single greatest type of incident that police officers respond to in the U.S. Um, where officers are, are shot and killed while responding than domestic violence, that we see more officer-related deaths um, responding to domestic violence than when they respond to um, uh, robberies or burglaries, assaults, or even reports of shots fired. Um, again, no other in type of incident um, claims lives of, of more officers when responding. Um, and I think a, a, an important risk factor to consider when we're thinking about that, because again, we know that officers often spend a lot of time responding to domestic violence, depending on where you are in the country, as, as much as 50% of police officer calls can be related um, to domestic disturbances. So um, I, again, they know, we know their risk is elevated for each one, um, but it's also important to note that that risk extends to them when we know the DV perpetrator also has a history of harming pets. Same type of scenario as, as I shared earlier, but again, looking at um, the, the suspect specifically this time, um, in terms of a history of, of having mental illness or abusing substances, 47% in general, just knowing the suspect of, of domestic violence also harms pets, you see it at 74%. Um, looking further at, at a history of suicide threats or attempts, 10% goes up four times. Again, just knowing that one thing. Access to a firearm, um, most often the way that I um, told, was told that, that this means when, when referred to in this way is that they, they have a gun on their on their person, 31% in general, nearly 70%, and then having used a weapon against a partner of 26 to 66. So again, just knowing the one thing, um, it, it means that the perpetrator may be more likely um, to have mental illness, to abuse a substance, and to have a gun, um, just a worst case scenario for responders. Um, we're seeing more and more agencies ask the question about pets, so officers will often have um, questionnaires or, or forms that they'll fill out at every scene. And we, we are seeing more and more asked the question. Here you see in Massachusetts, the 19th question asked, um, has the offender abused animals or pets? Um, but I'm pushing for it to be asked even sooner. I know in some of the states I've spoken at or spoken, they, they've moved this up because the reality is, is when we get a yes there and we know the offender abused animals or pets or has that history, we can statistically speaking, mark all these boxes yes to. Um, again, it's a high catch question. So if you get a yes there, you know risk has dramatically spiked in many other areas as well. We think about, um, I, I, when I work with officers, they talk about um, concerns for completing these types of questionnaires, though they're required to by their department for their own safety while doing so. This is a question we wanna ask and we wanna ask it early because if we get a yes, you know, ideally if I was a responder, I'd wanna know this information before I got to the scene, you know, even on my way. Um, the idea that that um, the offender has this history because it increases my risk dramatically as well. That being said, among perpetrators who also harm pets, the risk is, appears to be greater. We actually see them less likely to be arrested um, than, than domestic violence perpetrators that don't have this pet abuse history. Um, why that occurs, I think there's probably many reasons, but here's one reason. When we look at how officers observe, again, these pet abusing domestic violence perpetrators, great risk that these perpetrators um, create for all. <clears throat> Statistically speaking, though, they are much more likely to appear calm, apologetic, and crying on scene. And so kind of I think our normal human reaction when we see someone respond this way um, is, is, is maybe to relax or let our guard down. But again, we do not know what's just below the surface. Many of these um, pet abusing domestic violence perpetrators are excellent mask wearers. Um, they, they are great at, at looking one way to others outside the home and just showing sheer terror to those inside the home. So it's so important to note that even though they may appear this way, um, again, we, the, the data doesn't lie and we know the risk is there. So I think it's just an important reminder when you have a perpetrator who has a, a history of harming pets, don't trust this appearance, trust what the data and the numbers show. And that is that you are at great risk. And if you leave that perpetrator in that home, um, that family is an immediate great risk um, because again, they, they, they finally had the courage to call and report. And if you leave them there in that scenario, risk is gonna spike immediately. I'll share a couple of examples. Um, as I said, for effective intervention, <clears throat> I talked earlier about the concerns for children in these homes and, and the physiological changes and damage that's done. Again, I, as I said, it, it doesn't mean there's no hope. Um, here's Mi Escolita is a, a school, a preschool program. I believe it now it's in a few different states um, that, that um, 
uh, targets children specifically from homes where domestic violence occurs. Um, they, they ensure all their staff has trauma-informed care training, um, and they provide this education um, um, for these children with, with, with the history of their victimization in mind. We see children from these dedicated specific programs go on to do as good or better than their peers in the public school system. So again, when we think about some of the damage, particularly in those early years, it doesn't mean there's no hope. It just means we must address it and work through it effectively um, to allow these children um, to have that, that type of hope in future. I talked extensively about this and, and it makes sense, right? The idea of the importance of pets. Um, humans who are abused by humans will often struggle to trust humans. Um, pets can be a critical part of the healing, rebuilding, and um, recovery process if they're permitted to take part. Uh, we see more and more domestic violence shelters incorporating pets in their planning. Here you see a shelter um, actually in Pennsylvania. Um, my understanding was uh, through work with Red Rover and this particular community, the, the um, time and, and um, resources were um, um, donated by the um, Eagle Scouts in the area. Um, and again, when you look at these types of things, you may think, well, you know, oh, it's just a couple of pets that, that that may help. And I tell you, though, to those families, it means the world. Um, and, and these acts and, and doing this is so critical to better helping these, these victims and families. Um, when we see shelters become pet friendly or have pet friendly options, um, we rarely see them sit empty for long. It's usually the opposite. We have many victims out there just waiting, um, waiting so that they can bring their pet to and then they will come to safety again making a safe place for that pet. Um, we'll get the, the human to safety too. I often say, you know, when we, when we make these places pet friendly, it's not about protecting pets over people. It's about getting people, pet pairs to safety that would otherwise never come. For a searchable list in, in, around the US, um, I often recommend the Animal Welfare Institute Safe Havens Mapping Project. You can just put in your information, your address, your location there and see any shelters in your area that, that offer these types of services. Um, while there are more and more of these um, continuing to open, there's still work to be done. Um, a recent survey, not surprisingly, found 87% of victims um, indicate that a safe place to bring their pet would make it easier for them to leave. Mind blowing, right? We have to pay attention to that 87. It's so hard for victims to leave these homes and end these relationships. And they're saying, do this one thing and it makes it easier. That being said, only 18% of shelters currently accept pets on site. Now some do have foster options, but again, um, we think particularly for children and many of these kids, the idea of safety is novel to them. They, they don't know what a safe place looks like. And so not being able to see their pet, they're going to have trouble believing the pet is safe. Um, so while foster programs are better than nothing because they do allow these, you know, they, they, they do reduce an important barrier. They allow victims to leave and bring that pet out of that dangerous home too. Ideally, we'd like to see them be able to have access to that animal again if if the pet is is, is their corner so to speak their, their emotional support asking them to leave that corner behind um, often creates or, or even if, if it's separate and sent to a different location um, it can create an additional layer of emotional trauma for both uh, more than just the reasons i've described but there's actually science to support the, the benefit of keeping these pairs together um, studies indicate i talked about cortisol earlier um, that, that pet dogs in particular can, um, are more effective at mitigating the harmful effects of cortisol for children than their caregivers are. Uh, studies also find that among uh, females that um, dogs are a better buffer to stress than their best girlfriend and that among, um, partner or among partners in the U.S. Um, that dogs are a better buffer to stress than an individual's partner. Um, so again, studies continue to find that dogs are awesome um, and that these pets can often provide critical support um, at a time these victims need it most. The idea of, of animal welfare and human welfare working together is not novel. It's actually a return to our roots. You may or may not know that, that organized efforts to protect animals predated those to protect children in the U.S. Um, you see the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was started in 1866. Um, through continued concerning conditions for children and the work of, of um, Etta Wheeler, a religious um, nun um, in the New York area. She reached out to Henry Berg. They worked together to create the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children eight years later. Again, working with animal welfare is, 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 is a return to our roots. Um, I think many times our efforts have kind of separated over the years, but what an important time to look at renewing these partnerships and strengthening them. Uh, we absolutely, Again, you know, uh, domestic violence, family violence does not appear to be an issue that's going away. We absolutely need um, all the assistance and help we can get in effectively fighting this issue. And it makes so much sense to me to, to look at strengthening relationships with animal welfare as well. 
as I said, it was my dog who saved my life. Um, for me, my escape from the harm and, and home was was walks with him. It was the one time when I when I felt like I I could really get away from everything. Um, we had a lot of fields around our house, and he and I would I don't know how many miles we trekked. Um, uh, you might see a worn out football behind me. I just recently found that um, it was the football he and I played with for for um, much of the the worst of of the harm that I experienced. Um, but my time with him on those walks, I'll never forget again, just, just what it meant. Um, in my book, in the intro, I, I talk about what I wouldn't give for one more walk and it's true. Um, um, I, I miss him even to this day so deeply and dearly. Um, on our last walk, Shelby was old. He was 17. His legs gave out. Um, and, and I remember him just laying there looking up at me so scared. Um, and, and I picked him up and I carried him home um, just as he had carried me for so long. Um, and just as I think pets carry children in many of these homes um, and, and it's so important that we're including them in our planning um, throughout much of it I, I would i would remember looking back and thinking my life had no account or i look back and, and remember feeling like my life had no meaning it was just going to be a sacrifice i was doing all these things to protect my mom and sister um, people would ask me what do you uh, want to be when you grow up and i would say it doesn't matter um, i would eventually even make a deal with my dad and i said i would meet him um, every week to two weeks for, for dinner and appear that everything was okay on the outside as long as he would leave my mom and sister alone. Um, and that, again, caused a lot of harm having to sit there across from him every week. I could never escape these things because I had to continually see him and continually pretend like things were okay. On those nights, I would just come home to that dog. Um, again, I, I can't put it into words what, what, what he did for me and the love he spoke into me. It was his love that helped enable me to break the cycle of, of harm and abuse and create a safe environment for my own children. Um, and I'm forever grateful. I, I wish I could go back and just one more time hug him and thank him. Um, I, I, I look back and I often think, you know, I, I know he did so much for me, but I realized in the moment um, that I had no idea the full extent of what that dog was doing for me every day. Um, and, 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 and some of the best things in my life and, and all of the best things in my life, um, you know, I, I, I attribute in, in big part to that relationship. And again, I, I wish I could um, go back and thank him one more time. Um, here's the book that, that I, I just wrote last month. It's called Not Without My Pet. It's available on Amazon. Um, I know they, they sold out of the initial shipment, so I think more books are coming back in um, through the publisher. Uh, it's available on, or it should be shortly, on Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, anywhere where books are sold online, but also on Amazon as a Kindle or, or as a paperback. Again, dives, dives much deeper um, into some of the issues we've described today and the importance of, 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 of these pets um, and, and these victims' lives. Here's my contact info. Um, again, if, if I'll, I know we just have a few minutes here for questions, but also feel free to email me with any other ways to connect with me there on social media. And again, thank you so much for the time today. Um, as I said, uh, I appreciate each and every opportunity and, and I appreciate the work you do, do in your community and, and your interest in, the, in these topics and issues. So again, thank you for the time today. Um, and and I, I, I really appreciate it. So. Andrew, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you being with us today. And you have um, picked up a lot of um, interaction here on our chat. Um, the workshop participants have been chatting back and forth with each other, making connections um, during your presentation. So I did go onto the chat and ask that if anybody had any questions for you, to put that into our Q&A module. Um, so we do have some that came in already, so I will share those um, with you. Um, one of them here is from um, Adrian Hoker, understanding the bond between people, especially children and their animals, and now having your own children. Do you have a dog? I have two. We have a, a brother, sister, a golden doodle uh, pair. Um, absolutely. I, I'll admit that the it's hard when you when I lost Shelby I, I've always had dogs but it's like they create a hole I mean when you lose that it's it's like a hole is gone that, that you can never refill um, but but they come and they create a new space in your heart that maybe you didn't even know you had and so yes I'm sure dogs will always be um, part of our family and an important part as well we have another question from Anastasia from transitions of Pennsylvania said, it doesn't look like my state's SPCA officers are mandated reporters. What is the best way to engage local animal welfare workers in domestic violence prevention? That's a great question. And that's honestly the whole purpose of the new study I just wrote, because there wasn't really that. That was one of the questions I and I try to again, my whole mission here is to create as much good and change as I can. 
Um, and so I address that specifically, particularly with the child side and, and my new study um, that will be open access. It'll be free to all, for all when it's when it's there. It's in peer review still. Um, so that will at least arm us academically with with a clear indication of, of why it's important that that and, and in that study, um, I, I, I call for what you just referred to or, or ask about. And that is a, a mandated reporting when children are involved, particularly and also note the domestic violence side um, in terms of, of, of you know, from a, I think it's different in each community, um, but but it starts by by getting everyone to the table and, and at least beginning those relate those conversations about that relationship. Um, I know in my, you know, in some communities, there's still not even a strong partnership um, with with law enforcement and child welfare about reporting when children are involved in domestic violence incidents. Um, and so I, I, I know that there have there's a major need for a kind of a um, national mandate and, and, and clear evidence. So I'm hoping this study provides that it's it's literally why I wrote it again. Um, I. I the, the, the data is so clear to support it, and I use animal control data for this very purpose. So um, I, I think other than that, it's it's, it's providing education. I, I would be happy to share materials that I have. I've, I've given or prepared specific presentations just for animal welfare on that topic. And so I do have some additional studies and, and several papers that I've published and written that I'd be happy to share if you email me. Um, sometimes it's just about providing that information and, and helping agencies see why it's important, not only to protect these families, but for their agency as well in terms of, of, of reducing risk and, and improving outcomes for all. Thank you. And I'm freezing up here on my side, so my apologies that my camera is frozen. But um, we did have a question that came in regarding the handouts for your workshop presentation. So I do want to share with everybody, if you go to the event resources module on your left hand side, um, once you're in your virtual lobby, there is a folder there marked event information. And within that folder, there is another folder that says keynote speaker Andrew Campbell. And that is where you will be able to um, access all of Andrew's handouts that he provided um, to us to share with all of you. Now, this is a question um, that I will ask, um, but I'm not sure if you would necessarily know the answer to this. And we have Laura from the Department of Corrections um, asked about, um, you know, whether or not there are shelters that allow you to bring your pets with you when you have to leave home. So I do know that our chat was very active um, and people kind of networking while you were doing your presentation, you know, sharing different um, resources in Pennsylvania that people may be able to connect with. And I think one of the items that I saw in the chat was the Red Rover that you mentioned. Um, but any other, any other tips or anything you'd like to share for people that are curious about um, shelters allowing pets and how to maybe work to enable that? Red Rover is a, a, a great place to start and looking at their website and the, the options that they provide. They um, can um, also provide potentially grant funding to, to help um, convert domestic violence shelters to, to incorporate at least a, a pet friendly piece. Um, I can think of um, in terms of, again, the, the number I shared about 18 percent having shelter or having shelter space on site is kind of getting to that. So um, the, the actual number was published in 2020 in January at 16.5 percent. But just based on uh, media reports and, and, and the work of Red Rover and other organizations, I'm putting it to date. I'm guessing at about 18 percent of U.S. shelters allow at least some pets at some capacity on site with um, humans, which again is 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 um, ideal. Um, we know there are barriers to protecting pets, and I and I never want to discount those. But the reality is is um, you know if if every time we faced a barrier in this field, we would never get anything done. Anyone who works in the field of family violence faces often nothing but barriers. And so while there are barriers to to, to allowing pets, um, I don't see any of them as insurmountable. And again, as I said, I, I, I know the, the odds are always against us in this field, just as they are for victims. And the victims have to get up and, and face similar odds every day. And, and we owe it to them to, to figure it out. It's so important. So we are seeing more and more shelters find ways to do it, um, obviously, but there's still a great need for more and more and, and, and until all have, have, have at least some way. And, and again, fostering programs can help fill a, a, a gap if, if there's no space for pets. And, and sometimes that can be an issue. Um, having a foster system at least allows the humans to, to bring these animal victims out of the home and not have to leave them there. Um, again, 
just often, often emotional anguish when you leave that pet behind, knowing the harm that's likely going to come to it. All right, another question from Jessica from the Victim Witness Assistance Program in Dauphin County. What would you say to a victim or family that is hesitant to leave because they don't trust a DV pet foster program to keep their pet safe? So this this again falls into I have a whole I have about I have several different trainings and talks that I do I, I do one right now um, based on the pandemic um, that I, I I and I put this in a lot of my um, papers and I think at least one that I shared with you um, I, I've been very heavily involved lately in the um, domestic violence around natural disaster literature um, finding all kinds of links and tie-ins um, not just after natural disasters domestic violence always increases after a natural disaster. Um, because I often believe, as we know, when um, you know the, the disparities are only furthered through crisis and disaster. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to note is is the barrier, the greatest barrier to to families leaving and fleeing um, a disaster before Hurricane Katrina was this exact thing. Um, they didn't want to leave their pets behind because pets were often incorporated in planning for for uh, disaster evacuation. Um, and the, the Pets Act helped with that and, and gave additional funding for communities to begin to explore how they could keep pets safe. Um, and it's kind of what I'm pushing for now as well, um, viewing connections between natural disasters and family violence being a, das a disaster that occurs within the home. I often hear the same thing from victims and I put myself in their shoes. And, and you know, fortunately, I had my dog. If I had not had him or if I had been forced to separate from him when I needed him most, you know, even if he had been safe in a foster home, I get it though. My dog, that was my life. That was my emotional landline. Like that was my support. And having to even give him to a foster home, I would have been devastated. So I, again, I, I think that they are great in that they, they reduce the barrier, but in game here, we have to find ways. Um, some uh, shelters have incorporated the use of, of hotels. Again, victim safety is paramount. So we have to make sure that we're doing this anonymously so perpetrators can't locate them. Um, we're not creating additional risk, um, but they've utilized hotels that are pet friendly to, again, be able to have family units that, that allow for pets too. We saw that more and more during lockdowns. Um, so again, I, I, the reality is I get that. And, and I don't think there is a solution other than finding ways to keep these families together. Um, because while I said fostering is important and I'm definitely not knocking that, I think it's important and it's an, an important, it overcomes an important barrier. I put myself in that place. And even though Shelby would have been safe, being separated from him at the time when when everything else, my whole world would have been upside down. I would have been leaving my home, leaving my you know friends, neighbors, everything behind to go into a shelter. Um, that would have been the time I probably would have needed Shelby most. It would have been one consistency um, and an otherwise completely tumultuous time. So I, I don't think it can be overstated the importance of, of working toward that pets and, and people together. Um, it's, it's better for both of them um, as the animal obviously will have behavioral um, um, often some symptoms as well from being in the abuse. Okay, thank you. We have another question that came from Abby, York County Juvenile Probation. Do you see any differences in the domestic violence calls, uh, connections, dependent on the type of pet? Um, for instance, uh, dogs and cats versus small animals, you know, reptiles, et cetera. So it's a, an underexplored area in the literature. And again, my new study is the first to tie abuse and harm um, of wild animals into that mix too, and, and to potentially link that as well. Um, so just from just having written this, this study and this paper, um, there's not a whole lot of literature out there that differentiates. Um, and it's again, um, timely questions um, um, based on my study. Again, I wish it was here today. It's still in peer review, um, but as I said, it'll be open access as soon as it's available. Um, but I, I, I dig into that there as well and call for that because we don't really see a whole lot of differentiation. We kind of see things lumped together. And you also have to remember in many communities, um, there may not even be animal control. I know in Indiana, um, 30, I think it's 32% of our counties don't even have dedicated animal control. And further, even some counties that do have animal control only respond to incidents um, involving dogs. Um, and so they're already, um, it's already stacked against us to be able to differ differentiate. Um, I know that a starting point is to at least to get people on board with the idea of, of incorporating the pets and, and these other animals that we often don't even necessarily assume or, or associate as companions. Um, but then I absolutely want to dig deeper into that because I think that would be interesting as well. 
Um, we know again, all, all the only literature I can pull from is literature that that looks at the far end extreme when individuals, in terms of serial killers and and acts of mass destruction and murder, um, we often see that again they, they when we think about <clears throat> when we think about a urban environment, it's most often um, dogs um, or wild animals and cats. We kind of see a mix. <clears throat> Interestingly, when it's a rural environment, it's most often cats. Cats become the number one target. Um, and, and we also know cats are more often in those homes. So long answer, short, um, there's not a lot out there to, to support it, but it's something I called for in my paper, and I, I'm interested in it as well. I looked at it a little bit with the data I had, but I do think that it would be interesting to divide that out further because I, anytime we divide anything out in this field, we learn more, and, I, and obviously I, I think that's important. So, Well, thank you, Andrew. It looks like that is all of the questions that we have. So I think you answered them all. I do want to share with you that you are getting a lot of love and praise and thank yous through the chat um, that's still up and running. So people are very grateful for you to share your personal experience with them um, so they could learn from it. Um, so everybody, you have Andrew's contact information on here. If you need to reach out to him directly for anything else, and Andrew, any final words you'd like to share before we, we end this session today? I, I just appreciate um, not only the opportunity, but everyone's dedication to this field. As I said, this this topic is one that's that's near and dear to my heart from my own personal experience. And I just, I wanna use what I learned and, and what I experienced to help others. And I know there's many out there listening to me in the same boat. Um, many people in this field have that, that history of harm in their past. And so I applaud you. Um, it's not easy, as you know, when you do the very work that, that triggers you and brings back some of the hard memories, it's never easy. So I applaud um, you all for, for um, your efforts in this area. And thank you um, on behalf of the victims in your state and community for your continued dedication to, to finding ways to, to get to them and help them. So, and thank you again for the opportunity. So. Thank you again, Andrew. And um, for everybody else, your next workshop will be starting uh, around 12 o'clock. So we'll see you there. Bye-bye.